So let's talk about myasthenia and uh, why you have fatigue. Um, as you know, myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disorder that affects the neuromuscular junction. When you ask one of your body's muscles to contract, the way you do that is by sending an impulse down a nerve. And at the very endings of the nerve, we have these small little boutons that um, interact with the muscle at a place called the neuromuscular junction. The electrical impulse coming down the nerve fiber allows for the release of tiny little packets of a neurotransmitter, acetylcholine. The acetylcholine then finds its way in this area here called the synaptic cleft to a receptor on the surface of the muscle where it initiates a chemical reaction that leads to muscle contraction. In the myasthenic neuromuscular junction, those receptors um, serve as a target for your immune system so that your immune system inappropriately identifies those receptors as being part of a foreign tissue, starts an immune response, and ends up destroying the neuromuscular junction or at least clearing away most of the receptors. So what happens is when one of those little packets of acetylcholine get released in a myasthenic neuromuscular junction, it meanders around not finding a receptor and it gets uh, hydrolyzed by acetylcholinesterase. Um, that's an enzyme that's present that gets rid of the transmitter. Mestinon works by blocking that enzyme. So it allows the acetylcholine to hang around longer until it can find one of the few remaining receptors. And that's the basis of the neuromuscular transmission deficit that we have in myasthenia gravis. The situation gets even a little bit more complicated because one single nerve impulse does not cause a muscle to contract. You need many small impulses one after the other at a rate of about uh, 10 to 40 times a second. And those little impulses build upon each other to cause a muscle to contract and shorten and that's what generates strength. One of the ways that we evaluate myasthenia in the diagnostic laboratory is to repetitively stimulate a nerve. In a normal neuromuscular junction, every time we stimulate the nerve, we get the same response back uh, from the muscle. And that's because the neuromuscular junction works, it's highly efficient, and every time acetylcholine gets released, it finds its target and you get a contraction. In the myasthenic muscle, repetitive stimulation does not meet with the same success. The first time the nerve impulse comes down, you've got a lot of acetylcholine around, you can release it, it meets with success. But each subsequent time, it meets with less success, and so you don't get as much of a muscle contraction. And if any of you have had this repetitive stimulation test, you probably remember it. It's not the most comfortable thing in the world. Um, we do it before and after sustained contraction um, so that we can establish a fatigue of the muscle so that we can have it use up some of its nice stored acetylcholine um, and then we're able to see more of a decremental response that confirms the diagnosis. What this translates to in all of you is that muscles that are affected that you use frequently are subject to fatigue and that's why we get ptosis because these eye muscles are used pretty much throughout the daytime and so they're susceptible to fatigue. They're also one of the specific muscles that's affected by myasthenia because myasthenia is, is not a uniform disease. Why does it affect in many patients one eyelid and not the other? Why does it affect one side of the body and not the other? Um, our feeling is that there are specific muscles and muscle groups such as the extraocular muscles that serve as a better target for this autoimmune attack and there's also some randomness in how the immune system uh, chooses its targets. So as a consequence of all this, the amount of fatigue or fatigable weakness that you experience varies. It varies tremendously from patient to patient based on which muscles are affected. It varies tremendously from day to day based on what muscles you're using and how you're using them. And as we'll see throughout the rest of this talk, it also varies a lot depending on your state of general health and in particular on sleep. Okay, so is it fatigue or is it sleepiness that you're experiencing? 
Um, since I was asked to do this talk, I've been trying to listen to what my patients have told me and the things that they seem to say when they're having myasthenia f specific fatigue um, is that they actually have weakness. They have some muscle that doesn't do what they expect it to do. Um, they talk about not having stamina, um, meaning that they can't do multiple things that they used to do or they don't have as high an activity tolerance as they used to have. They talk about being unable to complete tasks and having to limit their activity. People who are sleepy tend to tell me that they start out the day and they feel refreshed and then as the day goes on they have more of what we might think of as mental or cognitive symptoms poor concentration, difficulty paying attention. I just don't have enough energy to, to, to do it anymore it, later in the day is, is the kind of thing I hear uh, from a patient who's actually sleepy rather than neuromuscularly weak. And of course, people who are falling asleep, not just during this lecture, but during <laughs> other activities, um, uh, those are people who probably have a sleep disorder uh, rather than having fatigue attributable to their myasthenia. Um, but of course, it's uh, often a combination of, of both of the above. Mm -hmm. Why should people with myasthenia have sleep apnea? Well, let's see. Um, the deconditioning of myasthenia and the prednisone uh, leads to weight gain. It's all about muscle weakness and, and oropharyngeal musculature is commonly affected in myasthenia. And also there is some component of restrictive lung disease. All of these things contribute to a myasthenic patient having a greater chance of having sleep apnea than the average person. Um, the studies are talking about prevalences between 11 and 20 percent. And those are studies that don't just rely on numbers of the apnea uh, during an overnight study, but rely on uh, uh, daytime symptoms. <coughs> Um, in people with myasthenia, this is challenging because you're telling your doctor you're fatigued um, and uh, you're on medications that can affect you as well. So the symptoms of sleep apnea may be masked or misinterpreted um, in patients who have myasthenia. Um, the identification of sleep apnea is essential in patients with myasthenia and the primary reason is that we can treat it and we have very effective treatment for um, sleep apnea both in patients with myasthenia and in patients without. Okay, well thanks a lot for your attention.